Inspire Instructor Podcast, where the learning never stops. Welcome, you wonderful people, to the Inspire Instructor Training Podcast. So on today's episode, we're talking about that first driving lesson and how to deliver it. I'm joined by Bob Morton, and as ever, Bob is absolutely brilliant on this episode. And even though we went to talk about first lessons, having Bob on, it was inevitably going to fall into a coaching conversation. But in a way, that's kind of what I wanted because I wanted to kind of have that conversation about how can you make sure you're coaching from that first lesson from day one really sort of helping your pupils buy into that coaching process from day one so i want to ask you guys a favor um you're all my lovely regular listeners and i absolutely love doing this podcast i learn from it i'm hoping you guys learn from it um but what i really want is everyone else to learn from it as well um so i want you all guys to do me a favor it um from today's podcast or any other particular podcast episode that you really enjoy is to share and like and tell um so yeah if you guys just could tell one person feel free to tell a hundred but if you could tell one person about the podcast and how you enjoy it and how you learn from it um and then we can spread the word and and let more people know so that's your mission for this week is to head out and sort of tell one person who doesn't already listen to the podcast about the podcast um the other thing i want to mention about with bob um i know and this is more more of a little selfish thing for me um so bob is coming to deliver a workshop in um newton abbott so if you're in that sort of kind of devon area or or fancy a trip down to sunny devon come down and join us um on bob's workshop um it's like bob being bob it's going to be fantastic um lunch included it's 95 pounds for the workshop on the 24th of september in newton abbott but if you have any questions then get in touch and i will um, forward you the details um but for for now let's um, enjoy the show so welcome to the podcast today we're going to be talking about how to teach a first lesson and, and everything that is involved in that and I am joined by the mighty Bob Morton. So, um, welcome, Bob. Is that in terms of kilograms? <laughs> <laughs> no comment. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, welcome, Bob. Welcome. Lovely to be here. Lovely to be here. So, Bob, um, <laughs> I'm going to start off with um, pretty much how I start off every single one of these episodes is, is how do you teach a first lesson? Um, the simple answer is, I don't teach anything. <laughs> so now, wait, wait a minute, I'm going to pause you there because I can hear Terry Cook listening to to this screaming because um, I had a chat with Terry and he says, I'm going to kill whoever the next one of your persons that says I don't teach the thing you're talking about. Um, so I 100% agree with you and I know where he's coming from as well. Um, we don't, we coach it and 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 actually how, how you coach anything yeah. is, is how we coach everything in a way. Yeah. Um, but I'm sure you were going to follow that up. I just had to kind of comment because I can hear him screaming at the at, at the episode. Um, so yeah, how do we, how do we go about a first lesson then? Well, I don't teach them. I take them to a place where they can learn inside themselves. That's that's the key thing here. Um, because if we start the process off by teaching them, you know, and and the, the common the common phrase that we we hear at the workshops that we do is, well, okay, you teach at the start and then you coach later on. But if you get somebody used to being told what to do, the default answer when you ask them what what is, oh, just tell me what to do. So they know that that's an easy get out clause. What I want to do is to, I can't remember who said, I think it was was Carl Rogers in his book, The Way of Being. It's it's creating an environment where learning happens. Um, We have to understand, I think, before we we really put a plan together for for helping our students to learn, how do people learn? And they learn by making connections between what they already know and what they don't know. Um, and they know a great deal about learning to drive because look, driving is just about spatial awareness and manual dexterity. And we learn that before we go to school. And we're, we're pretty much expert in it, to be fair, because we've learned spatial awareness by running around and banging into things and learning not to run around and bang into things. Um, and we've learned some fairly complex things without lessons, how to walk and how to talk. And we do it through experimentation, through experience. So we experience something, 
the brain reflects on it, finds places to store it, finds connections be between this new stuff and stuff we already know and little synapses are created. And we add that little nodule of learning to our map of the world. And that's how we learn. Now we can learn by being told what to do because those connections will still get made, but it's a very clumsy way of going about it. It's like, it's like changing your oil by sucking the old oil out the dipstick tube. It's, you know, you're, you're, you're working through a very narrow hole where if we allow the learning to happen inside organically by giving them some experiences and helping them reflect on it, uh, away we go. It's easy. <laughs> but we've got to get the right environment in the first place. And that's a tricky one. What do you want to do with it? Okay, what do you want to learn to do? Don't know. I thought you'd tell me. What sort of level of help do you want with that? Don't know. So we have to create the environment. And this is the difficulty. And this is the, the hard bit I found when I first started trying to coach. A thousand years ago, it feels like now. Um, I just, I, I couldn't really get my head around. Well, how are they supposed to learn without me telling them what to do? They, they can't move off and stop, so they must need my input. Well, how bloody arrogant. No, they don't. <laughs> they don't at all. I learned. And the, the less I was involved, the faster these learners were starting to learn. You think, how does this work? <laughs> and it's because you think people have to be taught something. No, we have to learn something. And there's many ways to learn. But experience is four zillion times better at teaching than I am. That's that's the key thing. So, But we've got to have the learner open to it. You know, if we say to them, well, look, you know, I'm going to try this new methodology and it's called coaching and you're going to have to do all the work and you're going to have to do all the thinking. You okay with that? No. <laughs> <laughs> what am I paying you for? But for me, coaching, it's about empowerment of the individual. And when they feel empowered, they love it. They absolutely love it and they can't wait to get more of it. So once you break down those initial barriers, the fear of being the decision maker the fear of making choices, uh, the fear of the unknown, until you break those barriers down, you know, it's going to be hard. And, and we've got some pretty slick tools to help us with this, human beings, because we learned it at school. The teacher asks you a question, you just say, I don't know, sir. And the teacher moves on. Ah, Because an organism will continue to do what has worked for it up to that point. Um, so it's learned behavior. Don't know, don't know, oh. So that this is why I use it, and people laugh sometimes. I'll say, well, if somebody says to you, I don't know, just pause for a second, look like you're thinking, and say, if you did know, what would you say? And see what happens. If you still go, oh, I don't know, but what would be your best guess? You're just coaxing engagement from them hmm. in a non-judgmental way, and that's important, non-judgmental. Uh, there's a big list of things we need to be a great coach, and it, it's... We were just chatting about it, weren't we? Humility before those that you wish to help. Um, and if if you if you haven't got it, but it's just if you persist, you know, you've got to know more than they know, probably. Um, although in a pure coaching environment, it doesn't matter, you don't need to know. But in a driver training environment where we're safety critical, you have to know more than they know. But showing that you know more than they know is just arrogance and vanity, and it doesn't really help. Um, you know, it's really about a level playing field, them feeling like you're a 50-50 split of a team. And that's that's quite a complicated methodology to get to that. Thankfully, though, it's quite simple. God, that was a long-winded answer, wasn't it? <laughs> <laughs> There's a whole bunch of stuff there to unpack. Um, the It's interesting you were saying about um, you need to know more than they know. And and I think from, from our job's point of view, you're right. I think you... The, uh, a good understanding of the road and that's kind of what the part one and the part two are about uh, be, yeah. and uh, whereas the in the part three is about coaching really that's what and it should be about becoming a good coach um it, it's interesting with something we do on our workshops um as a coaching um practice is to get everybody to coach each other rather but rather than it being role playing pretending to be a pupil we get them to actually coach something they want to improve in their life um yeah. And it's really interesting. I find because we do a demo as well before we start, and I find it so much easier to coach someone on a topic I don't know. 
Yep. Because I can't be then sat there thinking, I know, I know how to fix yeah. the solution. And so it is actually, I think, easier. And, and this is the bit you were talking about how um, we allow people to sort of just experiment and and have a go on on their own and and it made me think of the the quote from um timothy galloway which is um performance equals potential minus interference and i we 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 mentioned this on our workshop and it's for me that quote is driving instructors like down performance equals potential minus interference and i think if we learn that minus the interference part get out of the way and let learning happen rather than try and make learning happen i think yeah. and and i think for me particularly if we bring it back to this sort of kind of first lesson this i think is really crucial on this lesson because how often do people start going well this is uh you need to get this many revs so you need to make sure it's at 2000 revs and this is how the clutch works um and you need like a pounds pound you need to move your foot a pounds coin whip for um i'm trying to think of all the other references people use um and all of these sort of things and now you're trying to stuff information into the pupil who's now going all right i've got to do that that rev thing and then i've got to do that pound thing on the on the pedal and they're all trying to remember your stuff rather than just like get out of the way and let them work out how this thing works i think if we look at the end of the whole process you know this remember this this is how you do this this is so we teach them with a whole ton of stuff to remember and when we get to the other end of it, which is the test, we're sat in the waiting room. And instead of just saying to the pupil, okay, let me just help take some deep breaths, do this, let's show how to relax, remember our coping set strategies that we had for this, and doing that. The bombardment was saying, now don't forget, now remember to check your mirrors, remember. And then what happens if I test and they don't remember? And then we say, well, it's not to do with me. You know, they made the decision, well, it's everything to do with you, Bonnie lad or Bonnie lass. Because you give them a shit ton of stuff to remember. And guess what? The bloody forgot. So we need to stop teaching things to remember and start helping them learn things that become permanently wired as part of who they are, part of their map of the world. And that's where coaching comes in. You'll never do that. You'll never get to that point. An empowered individual who doesn't forget shit uh, is coaching is the answer. It's the only answer. Yeah. So i oh- Oh, on these episodes, I quite like to kind of get down to like the nitty gritty of, of what should happen. Um, partly because I think actually um, as it, within the industry, we, we, we talk about coaching and, and we have these sweeping statements like get out of the way, let them learn that yeah. sort of stuff. And, and I can hear sometimes people maybe thinking, OK, but what does that mean? What do I go and do on my les- on my lesson? And, and again, it's hard because every lesson is different. Every pupil is different. But let's say we've got a pupil. Uh, we, we've taken them maybe to a car park. They, they've never driven a car before. They're sat next to you in the car. Um, how do you how do you start that lesson? How do you get them to, to for me to be? Basically? Generally, well, beforehand, I've I've engendered a feeling of ownership in them um, with the chat that we have, the contracting chat, which I'm sure we're going to come back to. The um, and it's a case of what well, is experimentation. Um, how do you think you might do this? And you'd be surprised how much they know. Okay, how's that going to work then? Now, you've got to obviously, because it's a safety critical environment, we're going to take them somewhere where it's safe to experiment. Um, well, let's try that then. So how do you think you might do this? I'm going to assume here they say, I don't know. I might, in the early stage, just let them off the hook a little bit by saying, well, well if I was doing it, I'd be pressing that right pedal and making the engine rev a little bit. And then this left pedal here. I might give them some experiences to have. Um, and for your for your viewers and listeners, uh, if you want to see me at play with that, go to LDC's YouTube channel and have a look at the lessons with Danielle. You'll see me doing that. Sometimes it works beautifully. Sometimes it doesn't. And I'll say, well, if I was doing that, I would maybe try. Do you want to try that? Yeah, okay. Because it's okay for me to give some help and set up an experience to help the learner learn as long as I'm not giving them things to remember and I'll have them experience it and then we'll play around. And you'll, you'll see on that first lesson, we experiment with moving off at different speeds. Um, and instruction, and I used to do the same, I used to say to my pupils, well, you'll struggle for the first five or six lessons and then it'll all just drop into place. 
and it doesn't all just drop into place. We get to a point where we can fumble our way through it. And then a little later on, we come to a busy junction and their arse falls out and it all goes pear-shaped. And it's because they're trying to remember so much. The last little piece that they need to remember is the decision-making bit and it all goes wrong. And often, and we all, we've all seen it, they'll pull out when there's somebody coming. He said, you not see that car? Yeah. What made you pull out? I don't know. I don't know. Uh, uh. You know, and if, we're, if we're quick, we're in on the break. Well, were you going to go there? Yeah. Did you think there was enough room? Uh, I don't know. And the, the, they get into this almost befuddled state, and it's because the, the circuit break has gone bang. Too many things to remember. And we're operating in the conscious mind rather than the subconscious which is the stuff that helps us to breathe and to remember to blink to keep our eyes going and how to walk and how to talk. We need the learning to drive stuff in the back there, not in the front. Yeah, I quite well, often... No, answer again, sorry. I, that's, I, I, I quite often relate that to making decisions that, right, like you said, are coming out of a junction, but actually to coming into a roundabout, I, th I think is a really good example of that, where when, when you approach a roundabout as an experienced driver, you're... You just look at it and go, yep or no. But a pupil looks at that and goes, blue car doing that, yellow car's doing this. And by the time they finish that really long-winded sentence, it's all moved on and now there's a new situation. Don't and like, forget to look for the blocker. Oh. Yeah, exactly. And I think there's an element that they just have to experience it enough to to sort of kind of take all that information in. Um, and I think the same applies to to move and off and stop and i nearly went down a story about roundabouts then but i realized we've got a podcast on roundabouts go back and listen to lee um, so um the um yeah i think if we if you link this to to moving off and stopping i and actually any to be fair i think we're talking about moving and stopping here but for me any sort of control with the car um i see this regularly on lessons when i'm sat in the back and the pupils having a bit of an issue with let's say um, not wanting to put the clutch down be, or putting the clutch down too early because they're worried about stalling, for example. Um, so they have a conversation about it and then the instructor goes into like prompting and and making it not happen. Um, and that probably fixes it for a little bit, but it kind of comes back because for me, the, the, the issue there is the pupil has been told there's a, even if it, even if the com conversation worked together, um, been sort of kind of told this new information and then had this situation where they've then been prompted to do it correctly but they've not experienced why so the thing i always do with something like that is go and experience it going wrong yeah. and right and and trial it trial and error um so go and put the clutch down a lot later and see what happens like even to the point where let's let's break until we stall like don't yeah. do it on the main road but like yeah. break until it's and, well, and instantly the learning happens because they've created that little nodule because they've experienced it, reflect, and now do it. And it's okay to instruct to do that if you had to. But it's okay, slow down a bit more, a bit more. Don't leave the clutch alone. A bit more brake, a bit more. Come on, slow it, slow it, slow it, slow it, slow it. Right. See how slow it'll go? Oh, yeah. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> like, you don't have to say anything to follow it. Now, remember that. You don't have to. They'll remember it themselves. It's stored. <laughs> And that this little file storage system, well, it's not little, it's huge. Um, we can access that information in, in, in a billionth of a second, anytime we want. Um, what if I happen to recall something that, you know, that hasn't been properly connected? And this is how the human brain works. That's what all that we learn is all stored. Stuff that we haven't quite got to grips with yet, we think as, as an instruction, we've got to teach them. No. We have to help them make sense of it. Um, and uh, if you want to evidence of that playing, boys and girls who are listening, every every once in a while we get a weird dream that it pops up in our head and it just keeps coming back and it's quite vivid. And then one day it just stops. And the reason it stops is your subconscious mind has eventually found somewhere to store that information and made sense of it. So it goes away. That's what's at play here. So that's the bit of the brain we need to be engaging with. Um, and you know, I often say to people, "Well, look, you can do that." Because I say, "We well, can't do that. You can." Well, I'm not sure. Well, go and look on LDC's YouTube. There, look, there it is. There's me doing it. Sometimes I get the argument, "Yeah, well, that's all right. You doing it, but I can't. Why can't you? If a numpy like me can do it, so can you." 
And anybody who's listening, who's thinking, yeah, blah, 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 bloody coaching, 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 nonsense. What I, what I would suggest you do is to try it for yourself. Don't believe what I've got to say. Don't believe what Phil's got to say. The, the next time you're coming to a, a manoeuvre, now I'm choosing manoeuvres here because they're low risk and you're out of the way generally. Just say to the learner, okay, we're going to carry out this exercise. What you're going to do is, you're going to pull up alongside that black car and you're going to reverse back in close to the curb. Close your eyes and imagine yourself executing that to perfection. Let me know when you've done. I say, yeah, okay. So was it perfect? Was it in every way? Was it perfect? No. Replay it. Go on. Have another one. Right. Was it perfect this time? Yeah. What you're going to do with me keeping you safe, because I've got the jewels and stuff here, no matter what happens, you can't go wrong. You're going to execute what you thought, what you imagined. Execute that now. And as they're doing it, I'll just say, stop here. Is this what you imagined? Is this how you saw it? Sometimes yes, sometimes no. If it's no, what's your options? What could you do? Now, I'm going to assume here they don't, but I'm going to assume they go, I don't know, I haven't got a clue. Well, okay, you can go back to the start and start again. You could put a bit more steering on, put a bit less steering on. You go a bit slower, choose one of them. Now, what I'm doing in that is I'm encouraging them to be part of the decision-making process. And that that's key. Once they're in there, then, then you know. And eventually, they'll own that process. You will be amazed at the skill set your learner has that you didn't realize. And then once, you, once you've convinced yourself of that, now we can start using that skill set rather than overlaying our map of the world on top of theirs and hoping that it fits. And it does for most people. But then there's that one in 20 pupils that comes along that it just doesn't work for. And the reality is education moved this way a long time ago, as did most other forms of training. If the way we're training doesn't result in the people learning, it's about time we started training the way that people learn. And everyone's different. So every time you do this, it has to be different. And the only way for it to be different is not us learning 14 million different ways of doing it, is to work with what's already inside the people. Get the learning out. Help them connect what they already know with this new information. Stop trying to put the learning in. It's, it's interesting that... that element about the the maneuvers and i quite often talk about it like go if you want to first start practicing coaching use a maneuver um because it just it's a perfect environment to create that and then and then you can hone those skills into other things that you're te teaching the or coaching um <laughs> the um I, I and i think actually moving off and stopping element like brings like that has the same element because you can have this safe as well um one thing I actually like to point point out to my learners in this sort of kind of, particularly in that manoeuvre scenario and, and for moving off and stopping, um, is that we are experimenting. And I try and emphasize, emphasize that part because I think just it's human nature to, to want to get everything right. Yeah. And so I think sometimes it, it it's bringing their attention to the idea that we're just having a go right now. And actually what we're also, we're not just trying to get it right. We're also trying to find out what doesn't work so that you know not to do that um yeah. and i think that can be important to try and um, let, let pupils know that it's not only okay to make mistakes but actually it's good to, to make mistakes because we yeah. can pick that off because they learn from it yeah yeah Absolutely. exactly and i think when so when we come to moving off and stopping obviously people are like i don't want to stall don't want to stall and i'm like no go and stall so you know what it feels like and and so you what know, are what what are they the, sorry, yeah, <laughs> just, I was different. in the back of a lesson the other day with, with an, an ADI who was driving someone to a location that where they were going to teach them to move off and stop. And he gave them a, 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 a commentary about what he was doing, but it was instruction. And I'd said to him, So how much do you think the learner will know now that you've done that? Well, they don't want to know. So I said, Okay, so they should be able to do it now, then I well, well, no, no, no. Well, why not? <laughs> if that instruction was so good. I was like, oh, no. So as an experiment, and I'm always one, and you know, I always say to anybody that I work with, if at any point you think, yeah, well, that's all, all very well and good for you to say, I'm happy to, I'm happy to sit in any seat in the car at any time. And I said, just go back around. I said, to the learner this time, your instructor is going to drive it to where you're going to do the practice. All I want you to do is to pay really close attention to how it sounds and how it feels while he's doing what he's doing. 
and then we gave her a go at moving off. Nailed it instantly. <laughs> because we've experienced it. We're clever. Human beings are super clever. Absolutely. I think just, again, linking it back to the roundabout thing that I was talking about, um, a lot of instructors take pupils to stand by a roundabout and have a look at a roundabout, which mm-hmm. I think is a great, great tool. I think it's, that's, it's similar to that. It's like go and watch watch something happen and then and, and experience it but i think the trick that, that sometimes gets missed when they do that is that they spend the whole time talking to them about oh this is happening and then this is happening oh look see that blue car um rather than just go to the roundabout and shut up and listen and watch it <laughs> and then well, go, right now what do you think roundabouts are a tricky one and it, it is one of the things that i see going wrong on test um or oh, that's the feedback I'm getting from the ADIs I'm working with. And we search for this Goldilocks moment, you know, they're coming too fast, then they're coming too slow, they decide to go when they should stop, and then they stop when they should go. And we eventually instruct it into this little narrow band, and then we've got it. Now, just remember that. Guess what? <laughs> we forget. So the question needs to be, how are you deciding whether to go or not? And then shut up. <laughs> how, how are you making that decision? Or if they've already made a decision, you say, okay. So you went there. Obviously, you thought it was safe. Yeah. What are you basing that on? We've got to work with what's inside their head. Otherwise, you're, start- Excuse me. <coughs> you're starting from the wrong place. Yeah. Actually, interesting. I think this will link to just moving back to moving off and stopping. So we talked about the control element. Um, and But I can hear sort of instructors screaming, oh, but they need to be safe, and there's routines for that. How are they going to know the routines? Um, so, like, can I just, for anyone listening, just shaking his head at me right now. <laughs> um, um, so, um, how do they do that? How do, how do you get that? Because we do need to be safe, obviously. Um, how do we get that information? How do we coach that information out of them, basically? So, to say the road, we've had a play around with the controls, we found the bait, we've done all of that, we've been messing around. <clears throat> I might even let them move off and stop a couple of times. Um, just short, really, and then I'll say, Right, okay, up to now, I've been making sure. So, I've not talked about doing what in what order, we've played around with it and found it. Um, I'll then say, now, right, now we're getting to the important stuff. Being safe when we do it. Because that's my job, is to keep you safe and I help you learn how to be safe. So I want you to be 100% sure that it's safe to move off. Show me what you think that looks like. And then we discuss any issues. <laughs> okay, when do you think you would do that? Well, before I move the car. How much before? <laughs> um, well, a bit. All right, then, show me what that looks like. Okay. Well, I counted up to three there before you moved off. Could the situation around you change in those three seconds, do you think? Well, maybe, maybe. So if we're dealing in maybe, are we still 100% sure? Mm-hmm. And then we might discuss, you know, the consequences of not being sure and moving away. We might, we might not. But I'm never going to say you should do this, followed by this, followed by this, this acronyms. Stuff to remember. Stop stop working in the things to remember realm and you'll do yourself a huge favour. You'll open your learners up, they'll start to feel empowered and the more they do it, the more they want it. The more they are coached successfully, the more they want to be coached successfully. Yeah, I think the, the one that comes to mind, obviously we've got MSPS Alan Palm and stuff, but the one that comes to mind with, the, with that particular conversation is the six-point check. Um, oh, God. <laughs> And I've now got a sunroof, so it's a seven-point check, so I have to look at it. <laughs> um, the, um, so it, it's that, again, it's that remembering, but also just creating this robotic looking around but not actually looking. Um, and I always love the moment where uh, you'll see it with your pupils, when it, whether it's moving off or approaching the junction, where they don't look repetitively. What they do is they just, you can see them sort of kind of, they have a little look over and then and then maybe the bike doesn't quite work. So they have another look. And then as they're moving, they have a quick glance in the mirror. Um, and as we're driving up to the junction, they sort of kind of check their mirrors. But then as we get a bit closer, they may be looking the other one because what they're doing is just going, am I safe? And and they're working it out like where do I need where do I need to look to make sure I'm safe. I love that moment in a pupil where you go, yeah, this pupil is going to spot what's going on. They're not doing mirror mirror signal. They're doing what's going on. They're like what do I need to know? That sort of kind of vibe. And and you just Absolutely. know that was going to be a lot safer at that point. 
And that's because it's hardwired as part of who they are. It's my job to check. I need to check here. I need to feel safe. Yep. So, and it works all the way through. And I, I just use that as much as the time as I can. And so I try not to teach. That doesn't mean I won't instruct. I haven't had to for a long time, but I'll happily do it if I need to. And then say, did that help? There's a, there's a classic one in, um, it's in Claire's lessons, I think, where I, I was giving her instruction about something. And, and if, if you look at it, and she's, she's looking at me like, hmm. And then I said, everything like, sure, you've confused me there, you know. Oh. <laughs> I said, oh. So, so she decides she wants me to be quiet. I said, what, you want me to be quiet? Yeah, she says, your jibber-jabber is putting me off. Jibber jabber. <laughs> just what do you mean, jibber jabber? And that's all it was. It was just noise. Because she didn't need it. She didn't want it. I thought she needed it. She didn't. <laughs> so we need to ask. There's a fantastic poem um, written by Danish philosopher Soren Kierkegaard, about 200 years old now, and maybe a bit more. And it says, if we wish to help people, uh, we have to find out where they are now and start from there. Uh, we have to know more than they know. But showing that we know more than they know is arrogance. Um, so we have to exhibit humility before those we wish to help. If we can't do it, we're not helping. Uh, it's a great point. I mean, it doesn't rain now because it's been translated to the English, but it's worth a look at. Soren Kierkegaard, poem on learning. Love look that. it up. Buddy. I will. I will look that up. Um, there, there was an interesting bit about that you were talking about um, being like you, your jibber jabber um yeah. <laughs> distracting i actually, it was upsetting at the time I yeah, was yeah. Quite oh, well, interestingly i actually experienced this during a role play session um i was i was driving and i in no way was role playing at people who were struggling in this event and the instructor the pdi started telling me all this stuff like do this and do that and i'll check your mirror here and sort of thing and even as an experienced driver, I was like, this is distracting. Like, I'm yeah. struggling. I'm trying to do stuff, and I'm getting told to do stuff that I'm already doing. Um, and that that's kind of a really good example of how it's hard to concentrate on all this stuff that's going on in driving while someone is going on at you in your ear. So, um, yes, obviously, there are times where we, for safety reasons, have to talk a pupil for a situation or talk them out of a situation. Um, but I think not as as much as possible. I try and reduce what I'm saying in the car um, to to because it just it just gets in the way. And I think similarly on an, on the same lesson, actually, weirdly, we were driving back, um, and so I'd come out of roll at this point. So now I was just driving, but I was driving his car. Um, we're going up this dual carriageway at Slip Road, and halfway up the dual carriageway, I popped it into fourth and he was just like oh you, uh, you need third in this car because it hasn't got the power sort of kind of thing so gave me that information and i thought it was a beautiful moment of and i said to him how did you find that out and he well i went into fourth and then it didn't work so i went back into third and i was like you've just oh, stole wait, you're the same <laughs> yeah, i know yeah i was like yeah and i was like you've just stolen that learning point from me and i it, and, it, and it felt like that even though i was like uh, it's interesting i think and i think that's the feeling they get and we talked about it earlier about how there's maybe an ego in that, in, in, and I don't think that like literally an ego, but it, it's that. Wait a minute, if I'm not telling them stuff, what what's my job? And yeah. but I think actually it happens the other side. And I've had a few experiences where I've been a learner in in different like w walks of life that it does feel like that from the learner's point of view that yeah. that, you, that experience has been taken from you because you wanted to learn it and now you've been told it. And, and I think we, you know, we feel that we're not doing our job if we're not instructing. Well, if we see ourselves as facilitators of learning, then you know maybe we don't feel the need to instruct quite so much. If we start to get serious results from not instructing, i.e., start coaching, start providing experiences. Mm -hmm. Now, part of that, of course, is that you've got to break it down into small, easily manageable chunks. Mm -hmm. Otherwise, you're going to have to instruct because there's too much new stuff happening. So we want short, repetitive routes that allow us to isolate the thing we're working on as much as we can do. Um, and then that way, you'll gain success very quickly. You'll only ever have, have, have to experience things probably once or twice. And they've been learned by the learner then in a way that's permanently wired as who they are. You never have to go back to it. The, the first manifestation I noticed of this was on the run into test. And I was saying to Claire, what do you want to do? I don't know. 
I thought, don't know. She'd never said, I don't know up to that point. I said, well, she said, what's my options? I said, well, we could maybe do some manoeuvres. Nah. Now, this was the first learner I'd ever experienced that wasn't obsessed with manoeuvres on the run into test. I said, you don't want to do manoeuvres? She said, no. I said, you sure? Said, yeah. She said, do you think I need to do manoeuvres? I went, no. So what do you keep talking about it for them? <laughs> and I thought, yeah, she's right. And I gave her free reign to do what, on the day of the test, what do you want to do? Well, we test, she says. I, said, well, I know that, but beforehand. Oh, well, sure, I don't want to do anything beforehand. So why not? So I want to be fresh for my test. You don't want to practice one of everything? She said, I do everything okay, don't I? Yeah. She said, well, why would I want to practice it? So I can do it. Isn't that what I'm, I'm going to just go and show him now that I can do it? She said, so I'd like you to pick me up and you drive me to the test centre, get me there in enough time to have a pee and a fag, and away we go. <laughs> and I thought, that was strange. And you start thinking about that. If you go through one of everything the hour before the test, you haven't got time to do anything if one of them goes really badly wrong. And then you've just panicked your pupil. So start talking to them about what do you feel will be useful to you on the day of the test? Um, and the reality is, you know, we don't always know best. <laughs> we don't know for sure what's going to work for them. We've got a whole load of ideas. And that's what being an instructor is. That's what I used to think an instructor was. You build up this big tool bag full of tips and tricks and things to do, things to say, questions to ask. Stop thinking about what question you're going to ask and look at what's happened and see if you can make a question help you understand something. What we do is we ask questions to see if the learner knows what we know. And that's not helpful because that's just more shit to remember. <laughs> so you say, well, how are you deciding? Start your questions with, how are you deciding what speed to travel at, how much room to leave between you and the parked car, whether to go or not, what speed to travel at, how much space between you and the car in front of you. How are you deciding that? What are you basing it on? How are you deciding when to turn? I think it's, oh, it's another Goldilocks moment, isn't it? The right corner cut or the swan neck. Yeah, I think it's interesting, and and we're slowly slipping into a coaching episode. Um, but but that but then all of the, all of the episodes have um because all of the people that I've got on believe that coaching is the way the way we we, we train pupils. Um, but what's interesting there, I think actually something that I suggest if if there's one thing you you want to do for for coaching to help your coaching like move forward. And it was described kind of in what you were saying there is be curious. I think if you yeah. if you're genuinely interested in what your pupil is thinking and feeling, your questions will naturally become coaching questions because yeah. you're now looking for that. You don't have to start thinking of them. You just go, right, I'm interested in what the pupil thinks about this in this situation. Yeah. And I'm interested in what solutions the pupil might come up with. Um, I think if you genuinely have that belief and that feeling. It, it actually comes quite naturally in the same way if you it were does, with does. friends yeah. having a conversation and they started telling you about something going on at home you'd be interested so your quote your questions yeah. will suddenly become coaching questions um because you're interested and i think that's the key is is have that interest um so i'm gonna just loop back around to way before we do all this moving off and stopping and um and again, I think we hear pupils maybe going, well, my pupils won't do that and and, and not buying into the process. And I've heard you talk a lot about um, before about um, having, creating a coaching contract yeah. at the start of the conversation, at uh, the start of the sort of kind of lessons and the learning process. So how does that how does that work? How does the coaching contract work? Well, I, I, I'm a firm believer in this and it's it's about setting up the relationship and this is something again from christian van Neuburg. you know you, you have to have the right relationship that person has to have a level of trust in you and you have to have a level of trust in them uh, and again you know we have to again soren kierkegaard we have to understand what the people understands so your first question and i always do this for free generally about 20 minutes i'll either do it on do an ldc do a home visit where the instructor visiting talk to the parents are you going to be involved blah 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 but I'll generally start with um, this 20 minutes and it's free. Well, let's just get things set up. Um, you know, maybe I'll go have a sit in the car, but play with that. We'll have a chat about it while we're in the car. So I want to do that because I don't want to talk in front of mom and dad. So I'm making everything as comfortable as I can be. And LDC have a set of terms and conditions. 
Um, and I'll, I'll have that. Here are the terms and conditions. What do you think that means? Okay, so we've got things about, what do you think happens if, if I don't turn up? What happens if you don't turn up? What happens if I'm late? What happens if you're late? Did you realize that if you don't turn up, I don't get paid? Oh, no. They don't know we're self-employed. They think if they don't, if they don't turn up, you still get paid. Oh, right. Okay. So what I say is, if I can fill that space, I'm not charge you. But if I can't, I'm afraid I'm, I'm going to have to charge you. Now, I've still got a little bit of a get-out clause because if they do cancel and I think, well, maybe it is, Jim, I'll generally say, tell you what, well, on this occasion, because it's the first time it's happened, on this occasion, I'll cut you a load of slack. I'll not charge you for that. But if it happens again, I'll have to charge you for the next one and this one. Does that seem fair to you? And then we can investigate. If they don't think it seems fair, then I want to know why they think it doesn't, you know, okay. So we start with that. What happens if you're late? What happens if I'm late? What I expect from you? What do you expect from me? So I'll go through all that sort of stuff. And we don't have, no, it's not we anymore, is that every uh, LDC don't have a time scale on the cancellation. It's just if the instructor can easily fill the slot, you'll not get charged. If they can't, so if you've got a, you know, if you've got a 48 hour cancellation notice, and you've got a one-week pass course booked next week. <laughs> so, you know, horses for courses. I'll then say, okay, so that's all the legal stuff done. Got that out of the way. Move it to one side. What do you want from it? I don't know. I want you to teach me to drive. Yeah, okay, great, okay. And I'm writing all this down as we go. So I've got a piece of paper that has a line down the middle. One side is what I want. One side is what they want. So we're dealing with what they want. And let's assume they go, oh, I'm, not, I'm not really sure, because they've got a bit of an idea about how it's going to work. Because if you ask a member of the public what driving instruction is, well, you sit next to a driving instructor, you make a lot of mistakes, and the instructor teaches you what to do, and then you go, oh, yeah, pass your test, and then you learn and drive. <laughs> well, we don't want that, do we? We don't want that. That's not what we're after. So I'll say, well, okay, then, is it all right if I shout at you? They go, no. Oh, write it down, then, on your side of the paper. Write it down. No shouting. Well, if I just raise my voice a bit, would that be all right? No, right, well, okay, no raising voice. If I made you feel bad about it, then, is that all right? If I can't shout at you and I can't hit you, <laughs> is it okay if I make you feel like shit? No, I maybe I wouldn't use that word. Is it okay if I made you feel bad about yourself? No, okay, well, what about if I was just a bit sarcastic? <laughs> and I'd go through the things that they've heard about. You know, um, what about physical contact? Sometimes I might need to grab the steering. So I might catch you as I'm doing that. I need you to let go and do that. Does that seem reasonable? Um, so I've got them to a point where they're all right, okay. So that's how it's going to be. Right, smashing. And then we both sign it at the bottom. And I say, all I want from you, apart from the, you know, the legal stuff, the terms and conditions, all I want is that you give me 100% all the time. That's it. And try your best. If we can do that, we're going to get on like house on fire. That's it. And then I am that instructor then, following it. <laughs> I will never raise my voice. I will never raise an eye. I always say, if I have a raise an eyebrow, you'll get that lesson for free. <laughs> the, it's interesting, actually. And I, at that point, at the end, is really interesting because we talk about uh, rapport building and trust building in the car. And it's great to have that conversation. But realistically, you, like you said, the that that doesn't happen just because you've had that conversation it's a start of it because actually i think if you're having that conversation the people's already going to feel like oh okay I'll, I'll feel valued here this instructor obviously cares um but you've then got to go and show them. you've you've got to yeah. show, you've got to show them that you're actually non-judgmental you've got to show them that you, you yeah and in their generally in instruction the first thing we do is say well you got that wrong so the judgment straight away Right, well, right. that was good. That was bad. That was worse. That was better. It's all judgmental. We have to stop doing it. Within that coaching contract and or coach, like, yeah, I think actually sometimes, and I, I've felt this before when I've heard the word coaching contract, it sometimes um, almost puts me off because of the word contract in there. Yeah. But realistically, like what you've just described is a conversation between you and the pupil about what's to come. Um, basically i call it a contract because we discuss it and we both sign it yeah as an, an element of buying into that that you don't get without that signature 
I yeah, think. and I agree. I think there should be there, there should be something in, in there. Uh, like I said, um, I just meant from like an instructor's point of view, thinking, am I going to implement this into my lessons? Mm. I can hear the whole contract thing just being a bit scary, maybe. Whereas actually, realistically, all you've done is have a conversation and then you've agreed together. Uh, so and, an agreement is maybe a better word. Yeah, a coaching agreement. Yeah, That's how we agree we're going to work together. Absolutely, and and I think is there an element in there about. So I think you've you you talked a lot about how you're going to behave, I suppose, and how, um, and and then obviously the le- legalities, and, uh, which I think a lot of instructors do already with like T's and C's, but again, it's going through those with with the pupil. Um, is there an element in there about how you want the pupil to behave, I suppose, with not so much like their conduct, um, or like like not shouting at you and stuff like that, but I mean just like engaging in the process. Do do you have that conversation about? um this is going to be an open like situation you are you can answer questions talk ask me questions i'm gonna want you to be like kind of coming up with solutions that sort of thing because i think that like you said earlier isn't necessarily what they're expecting when they get in the car that's right so i mean you know i'm, I'm careful about how i phrase that. i say i'm just wanting to do your best yeah and sometimes i'll say you promise me to do your best was that what this looks like today <laughs> yeah. and that is a hard, hard stop. Mm. You know, that's a hard no on what you're doing now. So, didn't you promise me? <laughs> and then we might then have a conversation about, is today's stuff too much for you? But of course, at each stage, you know, we have checks and balances at the end of a session. I'll say, what's our, what's our provisional plan for next time? And uh, you know, based on what we've done today, what do you think the next step should be? And I have a skills matrix that you know the LDC have it in their workbook. Um, this is you know the skills lessons laid out on a, a matrix that the, next week we can choose any one of these. Which one do you, which one of them do you fancy? And then at the start of the next lesson, okay, last week we said we we're going to do this. You still okay to do that? Still feeling good, good and raring to go? Um, and again, you can look at the lessons on YouTube. You'll see examples of it. It's not hard, none of it, because that's that's the thing that seems to be pointed at me at the moment. Oh, it's all very well and good, Bob. I can see you can do it, but am I, how am I supposed to do that? Well, if I can do it, you can do it. You know, <laughs> it's, that's it. It is that easy. But it's it's the belief, the belief in in your learner. You have to have a hundred percent unconditional positive regard for the person you're sat next to. That's so key. Yeah, and it, actually, I I think that is whenever I talk to someone about coaching, that for me is the thing that I push the most because without that, in a way, you're faking it or and or forcing it, um, yeah. and that's why the the set. I tell you what happens when you don't have that is the second you get that first, I don't know, you then yeah. tell them the answer. You care and start instructing, yeah. Because you're like, of course you don't know. I know you don't know because I because I don't believe you know. And yeah, I'll right. give right. you some information rather than genu- if you genuinely believe they that they do know or can work it out, then you won't you won't cave on that first. I don't know. You'll dig a little bit deeper or help them come up with a way of working it out. Yeah. Um, yeah. Yeah. So I think. The, so just linking back to rapport building now just, and and i know we talked about we talked before we came on uh started the podcast about how obviously contract it, the the contract is the part of that because i think if you're creating that equal relationship that's partly a, a, a building rapport mm-hmm. on a first lesson then so quite often we do a bit of driving on that first lesson like to to the practice area um do you do anything particular about around starting that sort of kind of process of building rapport on that drive well, I've, I've done all of the contracting stuff before the car moves yeah um and you know what i'll generally do is because i want to leave them free to focus on the sights and sounds of me driving um i might say stuff like okay i want you to pay attention to what i do here before i move away have a look at where I look. Also, have a have a feel of how the how this sounds. Notice what happens here. Um, so I'm I'm having them focus on what's going on, and I try and have the drive fairly short. Um, and then it's it's okay. Let's swap seats. Um, and right from the start, it's about them discovering 
ways of doing it that make sense to them because they'll stay permanent as part of who they are. Um, you know, the decision making process there through the coaching hardwires it inside them so they never forget. Um, and th there's a challenge for your listeners or your readers or, or, what, or viewers or just count how many times you use the word remember on your next lesson. If it's more than one, stop it. <laughs> <laughs> so i'll then just have them okay see if you can set it up the way that it felt when i was doing it show me what you think how many revs you need is that about right and i might even say that's a bit too much that you hear it. did i rev it that hard oh no no and i might even you know then, then once we've got the gas set i might play with the pedals at my side and say just notice how this feels now you do it not telling them what to do. Not notice how it feels. Focus in on that. So I'm hard. They're experiencing it, reflecting. Then they have a go, and we hardwire it in. And very quickly, they develop the skills, uh, and they can choose how fast the car moves off. Right on lesson one, we master the clutch in that session. I'm never coming back to it a few lessons later. So I never mind. We'll perfect that during manoeuvres. Jesus. <laughs> And I used to believe that was the right way to do it. Can't believe how wrong I was. <laughs> yeah, it's getting those skills nailed in because, yeah, why would you want to go? Because otherwise we just think creating those, those bad experiences, I suppose, aren't we? Because if it's not nailed in, we suddenly put them in a more difficult scenario. That's right. So, I mean, rather than have a lot of instruction that I give now, I have a lot of experiences that, that I've learned help them to learn. So, okay, let's try this. Okay, now see if you can do that. Now this, now that, now that. And I introduce these things. Small, easily manageable steps. And the master stuff, we never have to go back to it. Yeah, it, It's I incredible. I think that's quite interesting, actually, that bit where you're sort of talking about uh, you, you've you got experiences that have worked with previous pupils. And and, and I think sometimes this is maybe a um, like a block with, with, with when it comes to when we talk about coaching. Because all what's the point of me having all this experience if I can't use it? And I think the point is you can. The The only thing I, I sometimes do with that is give the pupil the opportunity first to come up with their own ideas because actually yeah. I can imagine some of those ideas that you have or, or solutions that you have um, come from pupils, like have come from past pupils, like going, I do. like, can I do exactly. that? And I and I I always love it. and I always love a solution that a pupil comes up with because what and I'm like wow that's amazing but also it works so well when it, when it's their own solution absolutely uh, so because it just they don't have to remember it because it's there hundred percent so is there anything else you would like to talk about um as regards to that first lesson with a pupil no I think it's just a case of experimenting with things for ourselves and then reflecting on, did that work, did it not? If I was gonna do it again, would I do anything different? Without having, I mean, instruction is there and there's no harm in using it, but re try and see it as a last resort and experiment with these things when you're in the lower risk situations. When you're doing your moving off and stopping lesson, you're away from traffic, aren't you? Or you bloody should be. Um, <laughs> you know, it's, so it's, it's, experiment with things see what works see what doesn't if you want to see things that have worked have a look at some of the stuff you see on the ldc's youtube channel and then see would that work for me if it wouldn't work out what might work for you you know for yourself but try and do it without instruction and you'd be surprised i mean that was the remit for these videos they were never meant to be public they were just experimentation um and we found that i mean i left one live by accident so it's crazy really um and we found there was a market for it the learners love it um you know and the, i'll tell you the thing if you look at all the comments on the videos and there's math forget how many co how many views there are of claire's first lesson now it's about four million four oh. million <laughs> it's like oh, jesus how many have these people not got anything better to do four million views and i think there's something like 42 million views across the lessons and people switch on it. people love it and the reason they love it is because i'm so calm and i don't shout I'm not like their instructor. I don't get flustered. I don't make them feel bad. I don't use judgmental language. It's just like, well, okay. That was interesting. <laughs> what we're we gonna do now? 
think you, your pupils are particularly good on those as well. They're, they're both, they're, they're quite sort of kind of fun and bubbly. But what's quite interesting about that is because you allow them to be. Um, it's really, You'll notice I take the mickey out of myself a lot. A hell of a lot. It, it's interesting. And, about the, the lesson and the, it was the instructor who talked too much. And I pulled, yeah. I stopped the lesson and, and said... I can't, I can't remember what solution I gave, but basically told the instructor to shut up. Um, and the and then the um, suddenly the pupil just flourished. And actually, the the instructor after the session said, "I did not know she could talk that much." And I was like, yeah. "You didn't give a chance." So, and That's I think right. it's kind of credit to you that that those pupils do shine out in those lessons. Well, I think you know it's it isn't. It isn't by accident, and they weren't chosen for that. If you go back and look at the first meeting with Danielle, she won't make eye contact with me. She just won't. By lesson 10, she's taken the piss out of me. I'd say, this is interesting, and it's the empowerment. They don't see this as my process that I'm applying to them. This is their process. They own this, this, this whole thing. And as a result of that, they're totally relaxed because they're not. It doesn't matter what happens, there's never going to be a negative connotation. It's always going to be, okay, was that the outcome we were looking for? No. Okay, how do we turn what we got into what we want? So there's, there's very little judgment there. It's not like, well, you made a mess of that, didn't you? You know, there's, there's a, a quality moment. If you, want to, if, you want to, <laughs> if you want to see about owning processes, I dual braked her. She was going to go and I stopped her. Now, there was enough room, but just, it would have to be executed perfectly. And I made the judgment call, put the brake on. Oh, I didn't have to look up. I could hear the hen's backside for me. It's, I said, okay, that was me on the brake, in case you didn't guess. So let's just get around the car. We'll have a chat about that. It's okay. So, why do you think I dual braked you? <laughs> she looked at me and said, is it because you're old and nervous? <laughs> <laughs> well, I said, well, yes, it is. Hmm. What was it about that you think that made me nervous? Did you not think I had enough room? No, I didn't. Well, I think I had plenty of room. But you're right, you did. You did it. If everything had gone 100% right. Do we get it 100% right all the time? Well, not all the time. What sort of percentage do you think? And then we had a lovely conversation. She said, so what you're saying is I need like a little bit of a buffer in case things go wrong. She says, do you think that would work? Yeah. Then, yes. It's just brilliant. Yeah. And it's all born of the, and I think the, it took me a, the longest time to learn it. There's three things. You want to be really good at coaching. You have to have, number one, a way of being. And that's what we're dealing with in this contract building. And then the way we interact with the people, no, no judgment, no hierarchy. That's not, you know, we're, we're a team here. Uh, no judgmental language, unconditional positive regard, humility, um, humor, patience, all that sort of good stuff. So that's your way of being. You have to be that way all the time. Then you've got a set of coaching skills, uh, questioning, rapport building, listening, and it's all part of the, the, the way of being thing. And then and then you need a process to apply it. Grow's a good one. What are we going to do? How are we going to do it? Have we got the skills necessary? How are we going to work our way through it? How will we know when it's done? Execute. That's it. So you have a plan. You execute the plan and you ask, did it work? If the answer is yes, brilliant. If the answer is no, what are we going to do about it? Um, and it's a very, very simple, simple process. Um, it's not hard, but you have to have belief. And it's uh, it was probably the same for you when you were first in. It takes a while to get the 100% belief. <laughs> no, I, absolutely. And I think because I definitely came from that sort of kind of like instruction-led uh, PST's sort of kind of yep. vibe yep. and it isn't easy to suddenly just switch that around I feel like I always had an element of good questioning which I think some people then think is coaching yeah. um, and yeah. it absolutely isn't um, and so I did have to change the way I went through that That, yeah. um, and I think uh, and I'm still learning and I think that's the key I, I don't, yep. every day is a school day yeah, don't stop sort of kind of learning. It was interesting something you said earlier about um, talking them through being a last resort. And, and I just wanted to touch, I was going to kind of wrap it up, but I want to touch on this because I think it's a lot 
I think a lot of people listening, certainly maybe PDIs, particularly yep. if you've gone through the learning process with the larger schools or maybe an instructor that's a, a trainer that's a bit more old school, mm-hmm. will go, wait a minute, talking through is a last resort, but what about the levels of instruction? Like guided, then we do prompted, and then we do full, uh, and then so we do full talk through prompted and then independent. Like, isn't that how learning takes place? Um, learning can take place, but it's clumsy. Yeah, and I think there's an interesting element there because I'm I'm very similar that I I don't it, on any topic um, full talk through. I, I really it's basically full talk through for me is my get out of jail card. You need yes. it. Skill. that's staying alive yeah it, when when it all when it's all kind of like go into pot and i'm like okay let's let's get you out of the situation it's yeah. my rescue sort of kind of thing but I, it's but certainly... it, it, it's a hard sell isn't it this idea of it being the last resort because the boys and girls out there they see evidence that their talk through and their instruction works they've, they've got hard evidence this works when i'm in a shitty situation i can get us out of it so we rely on it because we have a belief in it. And there's nothing wrong with that. But there's, there is a better way. Yeah. <laughs> now, I'm, I'm going to, you know, I'll be going into a ton more detail on that when the, my, my coaching course, it's all, all set, ready to go. What I'm waiting for now, that banging and clattering you can hear upstairs, is the, <laughs> it's the finishing the work on the upstairs of our house. And my office is upstairs. As soon as that's done, then I'll be launching the thing. And it's going to be, the simplest of things there's nothing complicated about it and it's going to be a case of giving people experiences they can go away and have and then have it if you like become part of who they are so kind of practicing what we preach there's no it doesn't not going to be anything complicated about it there's a, a set of evidence that has to be produced but there's lots of different ways of doing it so it's 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 all about having people be able to de- build a set of dependable skills. At the minute, most of the industry has a solid set of dependable skills that they rely on and they're instruction based. It's very very hard to let go of that. Um, so it's about helping people because you know I, I did a lot of seminars and read a lot of books and stuff, and I don't know, I just I couldn't really I couldn't kickstart it properly. I would start with great intentions and, and then a week later I was back to instructing again. Uh, and it's hard to break that cycle. So that's my state of aim is to try and make it a lot easier. That's that's the plan. So watch this space for an announcement on that sometime soon-ish, depending on how quick the builders are. And the accreditation's all in place. I've done all the grunt work and that takes a long time to get that to happen. So that's all done. The qualification is ready to go. I'm just waiting to launch. Oh, wow, I managed to get a plug in. Look at that. <laughs> I, I was going to ask you anyway, but but yeah. Um, although I did to fail on the last episode, I forgot to ask Terry. So um, <laughs> kind of just get it in there. The um, I, I love the fact that we're waiting for CPD based on builders. Um, <laughs> so, <laughs> um, the uh, Do you want to tell everyone where, where they can find you about um, the final? Um, Clientcenteredlearning.co.uk. Okay. If you want to email me, it's bob at clientcenterlearning.co.uk. Yeah. And I'm sure you're on Facebook as well. For Yeah, yeah. I'm, I'm here there. I don't do Instagram and TikTok and all the other newer stuff because oh. I'm an old fart. Oh, oh, we'd love some Bob TikTok dancers. Uh... Oh, Jesus. <laughs> the world is not ready, Phil. The world is not ready. <laughs> um, so, yeah, thank you for coming <laughs> coming on and joining me and i would definitely be having a look at that coaching course when it comes out so always a pleasure never a chore thank you very much inspire instructor podcast where the learning never stops